Beginning with his appearance in Mario Kart 64, and continuing unabated to this day, the majority of the Donkey Kong canon is in fact made up of Mario sports titles. And you know, that's fine. I'm glad he's important enough to be there. A lot of these are excellent games in their own right, and somehow, just as many are Mario parties. However, this series would carry on for years if I tried to talk about all of them. Therefore, I just won't be covering this cavalcade of cameo games. Other than that, the only rule is that a member of the Kong family must be playable. Let's get started. Throughout the original Super Nintendo trilogy, there was a pattern. We could look forward to a new Donkey Kong Country game each November. Then, sometime in the next year, it would be followed by a portable companion on the Game Boy. These made a handheld trilogy, Donkey Kong Land. Shortly after the events of Donkey Kong Country, Cranky is rambling to its heroes, as he does. After a few hours of resolutions and colors and too many buttons, DK has had enough, and he snaps at his father. Uh, his grandfather. His, his, his patriarchal figure. People like Donkey Kong Country for more than just the fancy graphics, you old coot! Cranky says if that's the case, the game would have been just as successful on a weaker system that couldn't handle such fancy graphics, right? A system like, say, the Game Boy? Mm -hmm. DK should learn to respect his elders, because this was all part of the plan. DK and Diddy have little choice but to agree, when Cranky says he will call K. Rule on the telephone to request that the banana horde be stolen again, just so DK and Diddy can prove themselves. This story is ridiculous, and I love it. It's one of the first times I remember encountering metafiction, but the story is not the only thing that's odd about Donkey Kong Land. For whatever reason, Nintendo's Game Boy games tended to be much more peculiar than their console counterparts, and Donkey Kong Land was no exception. And I do mean that in the best way. It starts out in your standard DK jungle, but the deeper you get, the more whacked out the game becomes. Where country was atmospheric and realistic, Lands could not do that, and it embraced that fact. You'll eventually discover the sunken depths of Kremlantis, pull Kong letters out of the interface to make platforms, and ultimately chase down K. Rule in Big Ape City. The Kongs clambering through a cityscape is such a juxtaposition of the series' usual setting, and that's awesome. What's not so awesome is the gameplay. The story proposes something the game design fails to deliver. The heroes claim that DKC would have been a fun game, even without the graphics. So it's ironic that Donkey Kong Land is handicapped by trying to copy them. I'd have preferred traditional, smaller pixel sprites if they could have kept some of that fluid, fast-paced gameplay intact. That said, I understand why Rare made this decision. Donkey Kong Country would have been a fun game without them, but it was the ACM graphics that made it famous, and bringing that to the Game Boy was invaluable from a marketing perspective. It's just... I don't know, this doesn't even look that good. These assets just weren't meant for a monochromatic, low-resolution display. And you might be saying, well, of course they look bad blown up to this resolution. But oh no, it was much worse at the time. This is about what the game looks like on a Game Boy Color, but that thing didn't come out until 1998. This is more akin to what it looked like on an original Game Boy in 95. Rare made the mistake of featuring dark character sprites on a dark background of the same color, and on the Game Boy's tiny, blurry little screen. Ah, it's no wonder I never got past World 2. Well, it's time to fix that. <laughs> Look at how tiny K. Rule is. Anyway, I did finally finish it. <laughs> now, if the opening story was that meta, I can't wait to see the ending. Huh. No, no, it kind of works. Fortunately, Donkey Kong Land 2 and 3 would fix most of these issues. The engine was refined, the stage design was more solid, and thanks to lighter backgrounds and much better optimized character sprites, you could actually see what you were doing. They even managed to pull off some degree of that kinetic gameplay. 2 and 3 are excellent platformers for the Game Boy, although they don't really deviate from their 16-bit counterparts as much as I would like. The original Donkey Kong Land is certainly the most interesting. It did a lot to expand the series' mythology, but as a game, I can't really recommend it unless you're a hard Core fan. In any case, all three games finally came out on the 3DS eShop for four bucks a piece, so check them out if you'd like. So if you guys couldn't already tell, I'm a pretty big Donkey Kong Country fan, with Donkey Kong Country 2 being one of my most favorite games of all time. Between the tight and satisfying control, the great level design, and the badass soundtracks, I can't help but replay these games over and over again. But sometimes replaying your favorite games can give you a craving for something new. And that's where the Donkey Kong Land trilogy comes in. While these games may appear at first glance to just 
be the Donkey Kong Country trilogy were made for the original Game Boy, they're actually pseudo-sequels that provide all new and exclusive content using the same assets from their console counterparts. You bet that got my attention. I couldn't wait to play these games. My first time playing them, I remember enjoying myself, but that was a while ago. Does the Donkey Kong Land trilogy provide a satisfactory experience for fans of their home console counterparts? Are they even good games in general? Let's find out. Donkey Kong Land was released for the Nintendo Game Boy in June of 1995 with DKC2 launching in November of that same year. The plot is pretty interesting. After recovering the banana horde from King K. Rule in Donkey Kong Country, Cranky Kong jealously remarks that the game only did so well because of its fancy SGI graphics and realistic sound. DK and Diddy retort that the game did so well because of its gameplay, not because of its aesthetics. Cranky then wagers that his grand apes could never have defeated King K. Rule and retrieved the banana horde if their game was on the 8-bit Game Boy. DK and Diddy accept Cranky's challenge, realizing only afterwards that they've been duped. Now the primates will have to make their way through 32 new levels and 4 new worlds to defeat King K. Rule and the Kremlin crew once again. Only an 8-bit. It's a cute and charming setup for a pseudo-sequel to Donkey Kong Country. In terms of dem aesthetics, Donkey Kong Land is one of the most impressive looking titles on the Game Boy. The backgrounds are highly detailed and varied, and the sprites themselves have been reformatted directly from the Super Nintendo original. Despite reusing a lot of assets, the game features plenty of new level themes, stage hazards, and enemies to distinguish it from the console version. Personally, I find it a lot more varied and interesting than Donkey Kong Country itself when it comes to art direction. There is, however, one problem. One which my friend Game and Tank mentioned in his review of Donkey Kong Land. If you're playing this on an original Game Boy, the detailed backgrounds and detailed sprites blend together, which makes it hard to see what you're doing. And that's one reason why I wouldn't recommend getting this game in the 3DS Virtual Console, because it only features the original black and white color palette. Instead, I recommend playing it on a Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Player, or Super Game Boy. The Super Game Boy adds a fancy border around the game and will give stages their own color palette. While the Super Game Boy certainly beats out playing the game on a Game Boy, I'd argue that the best option is to play the game on a Game Boy Color, Advance SP, or the Game Boy Player. This will recolor the background layers a light blue, while the sprite layers be colored to a yellow. This makes the sprites pop against the background for the best possible contrast. The soundtrack, which was composed by David Wise and Graham Norgate, complements the great visuals. Like the graphics, many of the songs have been remixed from the console original. DK Island Swing and Aquatic Ambience sound badass in 8-bit, and I actually find the Donkey Kong Land versions of Voices of the Temple and Northern Hemisphere Spheres to be a lot more catchy and memorable than the SNES originals. The game also features plenty of original tracks as well, such as Mountain Mania, Kong Crazy, Kremlantis, Balloon Barrage, Construction Site Fight, and Track Attack. These tracks are all spectacular and right up there in quality with the original DKC soundtrack. While the game looks and sounds amazing by Game Boy standards, these strengths are unfortunately overshadowed by some bafflingly poor game design. Donkey Kong Land suffers from two major problems. One, the control is terrible. When it comes to walking or running and feels fine enough, though it is very slippery in small platforms, your jumps, however, have almost no momentum or reach whatsoever, making the platforming feel incredibly stiff and awkward. It basically means that you have to jump from the very edge of a bottomless pit in order to make it across. Your roll also lacks reach and momentum, and roll jumping doesn't feel as useful as a result. Also, and this may be the Game Boy player's fault, but I swear that sometimes the buttons just don't respond to input. I'll press the B button to roll into an enemy, or the A button to jump over a pit, but on frequent occasions nothing would happen. This occurred way too often for my tastes. The second major issue is the camera, because oh my god it's just as bad as Sonic Genesis. While the sprites are highly detailed and look great, they take up so much of the screen that you're left with barely enough room to see. The camera tries to compensate by panning your sprite off to the side, but it doesn't seem to go far enough. Thus, enemies and stage hazards will constantly ambush you from off-screen, which leads you to tiptoe through every stage so that you don't get hit. The awful camera also means that you'll frequently be making leaps of faith toward platforms you can't even see, and it doesn't help that the game is so bottomless pit-heavy compared to the SNES version. On top of that, the heads-up display is garbage. Lives are denoted with heart icons instead of a numeric counter, and there's no way to tell if you have your Kong partner or not. There were so many times where I would play a stage thinking I had the other Kong and could afford to take a hit, only for the screen to unceremoniously fade to white and send me back to the world map. And speaking of your Kong buddy, it takes forever for the game to swap from one to the other when you lose a Kong. Do I really need to watch this tornado thing every single time I get hit? And if you spawn over a bottomless pit, 
you're screwed. These control and camera issues take what would otherwise be a great Donkey Kong platformer and turn it into one of the most frustrating games I've played in a very long time. Any sane person would shut off the game within minutes of booting a save file after getting a feel for just how bad the controls and camera are. And that's really a shame, because Donkey Kong Land brings some interesting new ideas to the table. Like DKC 2 and 3, every level attempts to do something new in terms of enemies or stage hazards. And it certainly succeeds in making a memorable and unique experience. Each stage even features one or two bonus rooms, just like the console version. But because of the control and camera issues, many of these levels are barely even playable. Jumping on tiny slippery balloon platforms with these controls? Are you nuts? Many of these levels are also way longer than they have any right to be, containing as many as three checkpoints. And I know I said in my last review that Stampede Sprint was the worst level in a Donkey Kong game, but this cloud level where you have to ride in this teeny tiny platform for what feels like an eternity while getting ambushed by flying pigs from off screen just might take the cake. What kind of an idea for a level is this? Every level becomes an endurance test of memorizing enemy placement to make up for the terrible camera. And because the game is incredibly stingy with extra lives, I found myself getting a game over in every stage as I got farther in the game. And bear in mind folks, I am not a DKC noob. I've been playing these games for years. And Donkey Kong Land only seems to get worse as it enters the third and fourth worlds, where the game begins bombarding you with even more enemies and slippery platforming. Thankfully, the game allows you to save after every level if you can manage to collect the four Kong letters in a stage. If it weren't for that, I could never have mustered the patience to beat this game. I may have my reservations with DKC3, but at the end of the day, it was still a fun and worthwhile game that I would recommend to fans of the series. Donkey Kong Land, on the other hand, just sucks. And I dare you to beat it without save states and tell me that it doesn't. The graphics and music may be great, and there were definitely some interesting ideas here, but there is no redeeming the controls and camera. And that's really disappointing, because I feel that if it weren't for these issues, Donkey Kong Land would be a fantastic game. And to be clear, there's nothing wrong with making a game hard, but this is a game that's hard for all of the wrong reasons. You're welcome to like this game, just don't make me play it. So does Donkey Kong Land 2 improve upon any of the flaws of its predecessor? abso fucking lootly The plot is pretty much unchanged from the SNES original. Donkey Kong has been kong napped by Captain K. Rule and the Kremlin crew, and it's up to Diddy Kong and Dixie Kong to make their way through six worlds of 46 levels to save him. I remember reading once that Crocodile Isle supposedly resurfaced after the events of DKC2, and that this was why Crocodile Cauldron and Krem Key were fused together, but I don't have any way to confirm that. Graphically, Donkey Kong Land 2 has seen some changes from its predecessors. The backgrounds are now less detailed, and the sprites are overall smaller than they were in the previous game. This makes it much easier to see what's going on than in the previous game, even on an original Game Boy. Still, I would recommend playing the game on a Game Boy Color or Advance SP. While I would generally call Donkey Kong Land 1 the better looking game, Donkey Kong Land 2 is still visually engaging by Game Boy standards. The remix soundtrack by Grant Kirkhope is also phenomenal, though unlike Donkey Kong Land 1, there are no new tunes to be heard. In fact, Donkey Kong Land 2 is missing some of the best tracks from the SNES original, like Jib Jig, Mining Melancholy, and Forest Interlude. From what I understand, this is due to cartridge limitations. I wouldn't mind this so much, but it seems like almost half of the levels in the game play Lockjaw's Saga or Hothead Bop. Those are fine tracks, but when I have to listen to them for multiple levels in a row, it gets kind of repetitive. This is something that improves as you get farther into the game, but still something that bugs me. Gameplay-wise, DKL2 is to DKC2 as DKL1 was to DKC1. All the familiar level types and set pieces from the SNES original make the return here, with some exceptions. In fact, Donkey Kong Land 2 sports a reincarnation of almost every single level in the original game, from Pirate Panic to Toxic Tower, complete with animal bodies, DK hero coins, bonus rooms, and creme coins. While these levels are certainly all fine in their own right, I couldn't help but feel somewhat disappointed. Seeing a reincarnation of every DKC2 level with the same exact themes and set pieces in the same exact order meant that I came to every level and boss fight knowing pretty much what to expect, sort of like playing all the different teams in Sonic Heroes. Donkey Kong Land 1 brought in all these new ideas, enemies, and level themes as much as it brought back elements from its console 
cousin. And while Donkey Kong Land 2 didn't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel, it would have been nice if they could have at least reordered the stages or mixed and matched the set pieces to make the game stand out. The new level design itself is certainly good enough, but I felt that these thoughts were worth bringing up anyway. In terms of mechanics, the control has seen a significant improvement over the first game. Jumping has the right speed and momentum, and rolling and roll jumping better approximate what you'd expect in a Super Nintendo. Because of this, platforming about and defeating enemies is a hell of a lot more enjoyable than it was in Donkey Kong Land 1. My only nitpick in this regard is that the team up move from the console version is nowhere to be seen. While there's no button that it could be mapped to, Donkey Kong Land 2 still feels kind of naked without it. While the heads-up display still uses heart icons to denote lives for some reason, it does at least introduce a Diddy and Dixie icon so you can tell whether or not you have your Kong buddy. Additionally, if you lose a Kong, your Kong buddy will pop in almost immediately. Because of all these improvements to the game design, I wouldn't hesitate to call Donkey Kong Land 2 a better game than the first, but it still has its share of problems in the gameplay department, chief among them being the camera. To be fair, it is definitely an improvement over the first game. Because of the smaller sprites and more dynamic angling, the overall Overall visibility is much better, but there's still plenty of screen crunch to go around. And it certainly doesn't help that Donkey Kong Land 2 is just as overrun with bottomless pits as its predecessor. I couldn't tell you how many times I landed on an upper platform only to get blindsided by an enemy I couldn't even see. On top of that, some levels just don't seem to be designed with the limited camera in mind. I'm looking at you, Target Terror and Rickety Race. The water levels are probably the worst, since enemies can ambush you from every direction. While Donkey Kong Land 2 is certainly a hard game even barring the camera, most of the time I found myself dying due to poor visibility. Because the game is incredibly stingy with extra lives compared to the console original, I saw the DKC2 game over screen for the first time in years, in more times than I could count. The game does at least have a save feature, but like the console original, you have to pay 2 banana coins per save after your first free save. I still think this was okay in the console version, but in a portable game, you kinda need to be able to save at any time. I feel like Donkey Kong Land 1 was more optimized for that. In addition to the levels themselves, Donkey Kong Land 2 offers plenty of meat for completionists, with DK coins, bonus rooms, and creme coins. As with the console original, you can gain access to 5 new levels in the Kremlin Lost World, a secret final boss, and the game's true ending. As with DKC3, I found myself enjoying the game the most playing through stages like normal, but for this review, I decided to fully complete the game, for the bragging rights if nothing else. And I've gotta say, trying to explore these giant stages with such a limited camera feels kinda claustrophobic, and it doesn't help that the locations of many of these bonus rooms are kind of obscure and hard to find. Some of these levels can branch into a million different paths, which makes it hard to tell what's the way forward and what leads to collectibles. Like with DKC3, I found that going for full completion only makes Donkey Kong Land 2 drag out longer than it should. Generally, I'd call DKL2 an improvement over the first game, and it certainly offers an impressive experience for a Game Boy title. But I can't help but feel that Donkey Kong Land 1 did more to distinguish itself from its console original by introducing new and creative ideas. Donkey Kong Land 2 also could have done with a more complete soundtrack and a save feature optimized for a handheld. The screen crunch and not infrequently tedious level design also prevent me from calling this a great Donkey Kong game. Overall, the game's just okay. While it's certainly a hell of a lot better than Donkey Kong Land 1, I still can't give it much more than a cautious recommendation. Donkey Kong Land 3, on the other hand, is pretty solid. It takes the creative and original ideas of Donkey Kong Land 1 and mixes it with the improved control and design of Donkey Kong Land 2. The plot is a follow-up to Donkey Kong Country 3, and a pretty fascinating one at that. One day, the Kongs receive wind of a contest for fabulous prizes to whoever can discover the fabled Lost World in the Northern Hemisphere. Donkey and Diddy Kong rush off for the Northern Hemisphere determined to find the Lost World before anybody else. Left behind, Dixie Kong decides to team up with Kitty once again to plow through 6 worlds of 42 levels to beat her Kong friends to the punch. Also vying for the Lost World are Baron K. Ruinstein and the Kremlin crew, who attempt to slow Dixie and Kitty's progress. The plot's nothing amazing, but still much more inspired than the second games. The graphics, like the previous games, are spectacular for a Game Boy title. The sprite sizes are smaller, like in the second game, and the backgrounds are detailed while leaving enough white space to make out the sprites. Virtually all the familiar enemies, level themes, and stage gimmicks reappear, with some new additions as well. The soundtrack, which was remixed by Evelyn Novakovic, might just be her best work. The original Super Nintendo soundtrack may not have been my favorite, but it sounds great in 8-bit. It seems overall more catchy and upbeat than before, and it fits well in the game's many levels. Additionally, unlike 
like Donkey Kong Land 2, almost every level type returns with its original musical track, which makes things a lot less repetitive. In terms of gameplay, Donkey Kong Land 3 does a much better job remixing the levels than its prequel. While the overall layout of the game mimics the console original in terms of what sorts of levels you go to and in what order, the worlds and levels sport original names and remix what sorts of set pieces you'll see and in what order. The waterfall stages, for example, mix rocket barrels and tracker barrels instead of focusing on each gimmick in a separate stage. The same thing goes for the bosses, which are largely unique from their console counterparts. The levels themselves are pretty well designed and fun to play, with some exceptions. The names of these stages are also some of the most creative in the series, with some of my favorites being Red War, Total Recoil, Ford Knox, and Miller Instinct. These design choices allow Donkey Kong Land 3 to stand out from Donkey Kong Country 3 as a game of its own, whereas Donkey Kong Land 2 felt a lot more redundant. The control is just as solid as it was in the second game, and the improvements to the GUI and swapping Kong partners have also been preserved. In contrast to the first two games, the level design seems to complement the camera somewhat more. The enemy placement tries harder to work with the limited visibility, and the game becomes more enjoyable for it. Additionally, the game is a lot less stingy with extra lives and bear coins than before. This, along with a smaller focus on bottomless pits, makes Game Over significantly less common, which in turn makes the gameplay experience a hell of a lot less tedious. While you still have to reach Wrinkly's Refuge to save the game, at least you don't have to pay this time around. If I have any real complaints about Donkey Kong Land 3's gameplay, Screen Crunch remains the big one. Sure, it's definitely the best of the three games, and it doesn't get in the way as much as it could have, but I still found myself dying due to poor visibility most of the time. Still, considering the Game Boy's tiny screen, I think they did the best they could. Like its predecessor, Donkey Kong Land 3 offers DK coins and bonus rooms. Unlike Donkey Kong Country 1 and 2, I think it's actually pretty fun to play to full completion. For one thing, you don't have to complete crystal grottoes or collect banana birds, which is definitely a plus. For another thing, the placement of these bonus rooms is generally a lot better than in Donkey Kong Land 2, though there is the occasionally cryptic bonus room or confusing set of forks in the road to spoil the fun. The bonus room minigames are generally simple to play and complete, and it keeps the pace of the game going as a result. Coin Kremlings once again sport DK coins, but none of the barrel puzzles really overstayed their welcome. Collecting certain amounts of bonus coins will allow you to play a game of concentration with the Brothers Bear at their many sheepy shops. If you can clear the board under increasingly strict time limits, you can earn a DK coin and a watch in every world. DK coins are required to enter the Lost World at the end of the game, and watches will unlock level types in the game's time attack mode. Despite its simplicity, the card matching minigame is pretty fun. Because of the limited visibility, I still think Donkey Kong Land 3 is at its best when you simply go from stage to stage, but the side quests are pretty good this time around. Overall, Donkey Kong Land 3 is a great Game Boy title and the best game in the Donkey Kong Land trilogy. The great aesthetics, combined with more polished game design and a more unique remixing of DKC3, offer an experience that I wouldn't hesitate to recommend to fans of the series or even fans of platforming games in general. If you're interested in the Donkey Kong Land trilogy and don't know if it's worth playing, I suggest starting with the third game and working your way backwards if you like what you see. Before I wrap up, I think it's worth mentioning one more thing. In 2000, three years after the original game released on Game Boy, Donkey Kong Land 3 was re-released for the Game Boy Color, but only in Japan for some dumb reason. And that's a shame for us Westerners, because this is easily the definitive version. The original game was fine enough when played on a Game Boy Advance SP or Game Boy Color, but if you had the option of playing the game in full color, then why wouldn't you? If you haven't played Donkey Kong Land 3 at this point, you might as well play this version. There's a patch on the internet that will let you play it in English, so you've got nothing to lose. And that pretty much covers my thoughts on the Donkey Kong Land trilogy. In general, they're okay. The first game is very poor, but had some good ideas. The second game is improved in some aspects, but still kind of tedious to play. And the third game is pretty good, but still somewhat flawed. I realize that these are Game Boy titles, and that therefore the Land trilogy should be judged by a different quality standard than the Country trilogy. Even considering that, I have very little interest in revisiting the first two games anytime soon. They're overall decent Game Boy games, but if all you're looking for is classic DKC on the go, then I think you're much better off playing the GBA remakes. I recommend Donkey Kong Land 1 and 2 to hardcore Donkey Kong Country fans only, because I think they're the only ones who will really enjoy it.